Hi. I had this turned off so that I didn't have to admit everybody, but somebody must have turned it back on. So I guess this is the way they want to do it. All right, fine. Oh, the whole admitting thing? Yeah. Right. So I'm on the uh, Zoom as a phone call, Tori. Oh, you're the 715-292-2105? Yes. Okay. So I got through using the telephone number. I don't see Joan yet. I'm still letting people in, so we're going to wait a little bit. And I haven't seen Joan yet, so we definitely have to wait for her. <laughs> yes. Nice weather is a competitor with poetry, I have discovered. <laughs> There's Joan. Good. Yay, Joan's made it. But I am in. Yeah, we're just saying nice weather. Sometimes it competes with uh, poetry. I have discovered, especially Zoom poetry. <laughs> I was just a little slow. Am I loud enough? Yep. Oh, good. good enough for me. Um, that I I could find um, the one that said to register. And then I thought, well, wait, maybe that's the same one for getting in, which it is. I'm still letting people in, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like we've got a couple of minutes, at least on my, yeah. my clock. Yep, yeah, so you can...
Get your and I have the you. clock close by so that we have time to talk about each one, but that we don't leave people off at the end. Sounds good. Yeah, if you want to record it. I don't know if Zoom is working slow or what, but it takes a while for some people to be able to join for some reason. Maybe because this is only my second time. <laughs> well, I don't know that that should affect everybody. Kind of fun here to put names to faces. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. A few more. I will say that because we're on kind of a tight schedule, because Joan wants to get through all the poems, um, I would ask that only Joan and the poet communicate. And anybody else who wants to comment on poems, do so in the chat. In the no, chat. No, no, no. Well, I am, as long as we ha are within five minutes for each poet, we'll have time for other people to to okay. chat, but I will, I will have to cut it off if we, um, you know, if we go over five, but I was thinking, and I'll, I'll say it right before people start to read that with the short poems, they could read their rough draft and their, their final draft with the longer ones. They could just give us uh, a minute to, to skim the rough draft before they read it. But I think we'll have time to, um, have some people chime in because there's some things I would love to hear from um, the rest of the participants to see if if they agree that this improved a poem or or maybe they like something in the draft that the poet would like to put back in. Okay. So should I go for it? And I will we'll I will take direction from you then. So people in. Well, if terrific. You, if you tell them to stop, then they got to go to chat. <laughs> oh, sounds good. I will tell them nicely to stop. Yes. Do you want me to uh, share the poems? Um, well, first, I want to share the group poem with them. Okay. Um, it was a lot of fun to put your wonderful lines together. I tried not to change it too much, but I changed some of the tenses so we, you know, have kind of a match with present and past tense. Um, if you've got it in front of you, you can see that there's a line in italics, and that's where one of your lines got embedded. Um, what am I seeing here? Okay, I see it. Got yeah. embedded in the um, the group somebody group. else's line um and um what eventually started to happen with this group poem is that it became a poem uh, with a new look at reality touches all over my musical heart rippling with afternoon reality makes pillows from paper uses trees as lullabies the heart of Indiana looks down, looks like a downturned mouth shooting 13 lined ground squirrels and touches the spirit with serenity shown in faces. Inside the door, cords lie together like entangled nudes. Their reality is mine as they whirl upward in the late afternoon as they creep toward their crypt and the influence of tomorrow. My heart burns after I touch reality. But no one said you had to be understood. 
The ripples of her music creep into my heart, whirl away, seeking music to uplift my hope. Exuberance looks like you racing to me as I brace myself. Confusion feels like reaching out my hand and no one taking hold of it. Regret looks like raindrops on the window. In the garden of life, gratitude is a flower that has seeds that are here, there, and everywhere. They want what we can't give, I say, but only life can give you what you seek. There are some things in there that if I were going to take this and make it mine, um, are fun and interesting, like the fact that the seeds, the seeds are the ones that um, want what we can't give. And if you're looking at the metaphor of reality, when you get to um, exuberance looks like you racing to me, um, with reality, the subject, exuberance looks like her racing toward me, uh, that what reality does. So it's certainly... Um, is not a finished poem because there were so many different voices, but it was really exciting to see what you gave me. Um, while I was corresponding with you over the last few weeks, um, it was interesting that I realized that sometimes I would tell you to do one thing and then I would turn around and tell you to do just the opposite, which um, I hope didn't frustrate you too much, but that actually is what happens and I wish I could explain why. But sometimes I'll be saying, show us, don't tell us. And then a very simple, straightforward line just jumps off the page and is beautiful um, and is a powerhouse. Other times it's wordy and I'll say, no, no, that doesn't seem to work. And then all of a sudden it works again. So um, I think trial and error is what you have to do um, with that. Or have a writer's group um, that you trust. That's why I'm hoping we will have some time here that, that you can put in your two cents worth um, about things in the draft that maybe um, should not be lost. In my writer's group, there's one person who likes to look through my whole stack of drafts to see if I strip home and, and lost something from it. Robin Chapman <laughs> is in my group and she's an amazing poet. Some of you probably know her and she'll make a suggestion. And then she says, or not, um, you know, the idea that maybe this will work and maybe it won't. Uh, back when I was in graduate <laughs> school, a long time ago, I was studying poetry and I had the privilege of studying with Mary Shumway, uh, an amazing poet. At the time I was so young and naive about poetry, I didn't realize how good she was. Um, but she made a suggestion about one of my poems um, that there was too much repetition, that it was, was getting boring. And um, I said, well, I'm trying to show, and I can't remember what I was trying to show, but she very sweetly said, you're trying to show that, but you're not succeeding. <clears throat> it was such wonderful advice. And it took me months after the class was done before I got that poem into a shape that really felt good. And then I sent it to her and we corresponded for a while after that. So I hope you respond um, to the suggestions I gave you, the way um, I responded to Mary Shumway as saying, okay, um, this helps. It's not It's not meant um, to be critical. So we're going to get started. Um, I'm thinking that with the shorter poems, um, you could read the draft and then um, read the, the poem itself. With the longer poems, just give us a minute here to look at the draft. I looked at them all again this afternoon and some of you may have, have already done that and then read the other one. We can always jump back and forth while we're talking about it. Speak loudly and slowly. It helps that we have it in front of us, but it's nice to be able to hear you too. Also remember that these copies are for workshopping, which means it's not considered published. 
Uh, so they can be sent to contests. They can be sent um, to literary journals and legitimately said, no, it's not published. Um, but we can't take these um, from each other um, because you know they belong to each one of the poets. Um, Triad is open. Some of you uh, qualify for the emerging poet uh, category. All of you qualify for poet's choice and theme. So um, I hope when we start uh, recording the the poems that come in that some of you will will um, do that. Now Lucy has to leave us, right? Lucy? Is Lucy here? Uh, she was going to log in from um, someplace away from home, so maybe she isn't here yet. What do you know, Tori? Is she here? Tori! I can't hear you. I muted myself, too. I think oh, I okay. Might, I think um, I might have is... muted. I think I might have muted Lucy by mistake. Oh, okay. Hold on, let me see if I can get her. We can always put her second if that works. Yeah. Lucy, can you unmute yourself or not? Chat. Oh, no, you can't chat. You're on a phone. I don't know why it won't let me uh, unmute her. Why don't we move on to the second one and hopefully we can get and see if we can get, get it back. Okay. So Tim, this is short so we can hear them both. I know he's here. I saw him come in. Well, I, I can see his name there. Are you unmuted? Okay. Can you hear me now? All right. Now I can hear you. Yeah, this is only my second Zoom, so. <laughs> a little louder. I say this is only my second Zoom, so live, bear with me. Okay, so let's hear the rough draft and then, then the final draft. Okay, the rough draft first. Take away the sorrow, take away the pain. Show me all your beauty so I can love again. Only in the springtime with colors pink and green. It opens up my heart to what my eyes have seen. Hanging from the branches, your bleeding hearts will show. It is love's true beauty in my soul will grow. When your heart is broken from a love so true, you can only look to nature to find a love brand new. That was a rough draft. And here's the final. Early in the morning, before the sun will rise. Oh, that's the wrong one, sorry. <laughs> and the title, read us the, the title. title. Title is Bleeding Hearts, I'm sorry. Only in the springtime, with colors pink, pink and green, you open up my heart to what my eyes have seen. Your roots have strength to nurture the branches as they grow and leaves of and broken hearts whose beauties that you show. Hanging on like lovers as winds of storms blow past, the blossoms fall like teardrops and wither in the grass. Like a bleeding heart that weeps for all to see, many tears have shown me what a broken heart can be. Okay, do you want to talk about the changes? Or, um, I know well, what I suggested. You suggested, uh, first of all, I'm not real good at grammar, so you taught me a lot about all the uh, subject matter, the sentence structure and and I think the first draft, I didn't have it in stances. Is that what it's called? Uh, oh. Like I said, I'm not mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a mechanical tradesman for a living. And so I don't have a lot of uh, college experience or high school even experience. But anyway, um, the first one, I, what happened is I stepped out the door 
uh, after the uh, class last week and right at the bottom of the steps is a huge bleeding heart this year. And it was just probably starting to fail, you know, falling apart. And, and uh, I always love, you like to write about uh, broken hearts and um, tears and stuff because I get pretty emotional. Okay, anyway, so, and if you can see that, you can see that right in the beginning of the rough draft, um, take away the sorrow, take away the pain. And one of the things that I suggested to him um, was to not start by telling us what we all know, that nobody wants sorrow and pain. This we already know. Take us somewhere new. And that was by jumping down a few lines. Yeah. Sometime. And starting with that bleeding heart, then working back to that. One of the other things I suggested to him is when you are writing in traditional form, um, which I, well, I, I don't want to call it old fashioned in a negative way, but it is, um, it is um, not in vogue as much as reverse. And so when you're doing it, you need to put the meaning ahead of the rhyme so that each rhyme, and he really worked on that, um, working so that each rhyme was important. And so it didn't jump out at us as being, um, oh, yes, he has to have that word because it rhymes. Comments. I'm watching the clock and we have time for a couple. Do you uh, see anything in the, the, the draft that he lost? Whatever you wanted to say. The direct comparison to the flower in the last stanza is really nice. I, guess. I like the, the bleeding heart that weeps mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the, the plant is... Um, wilting and it fits with what he said at the beginning that I got him to take out that he was telling us about pain I guess my thought on on the rhymes is uh, uh the rhymes come to me quick and I I don't know why but um I've been I've only been writing for a, a short time when I was in my early 50s and now again the last year or two and uh but like I said, all, I look back at all the old poetry, even from 2011 and up, up till 13, and it, there's it's all rhyme too. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have a real problem with the with the freestyle or whatever you call it. nowadays the the new poetry because it's more of a story, and it should be. And I don't know, I just have trouble uh, writing stories or even telling them, you know. That's an that's an interesting point. But with rhyme, uh, one of the things I used to do with my students. We used to pick a rhyme that was not particularly difficult, like blue, and we would go around the room and say a line and rhyme it without stopping, that when you're saying it comes quick, um, that may not be your best word. And I think that's what you discovered when you were going through revision. Um, yeah. That, um, okay, no, it's not just, you know, um, when your heart is broken from a love so true, one of the suggestions I gave to him with that, think about that. Your heart isn't broken by a love so true. It's broken by a love that's not true. So once you get those rhymes, you have to think, okay, does this work? Will it stand as far as meaning as well as rhyme? All right, I'm watching the clock. Our next poem. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you. Any luck with with Lucy? No, we lost her. So I'm oh. hoping I'm hoping she's trying to get back in. Or maybe I'm she's trying to trying to get in on an iPad or something. Yeah, maybe. I'll I'll monitor. I'll let I'll let you know if she joins. Okay. All right, no. Terry, Terry's are uh, is long, so should I go right to the Let's um, yeah. Yeah, just, let's go. Yeah, I, I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. A little louder, but we can okay. hear you. Okay, I'll go a little louder. I've been having trouble with my webcam, and I'm just going to say it. I'm not a picture. I'm sorry about that. So, um, okay, I'm just, 
did you want me to go through a little bit why I changed the title or any of that stuff? Oh, uh, yeah. The, otherwise, I would bring that up. But I think that's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the rough draft. This is the rough. I'm not going to read it because this is long. But um, Mound Molesters and Mound Monsters were both in my mind the first time I wrote this poem. Didn't know which one to choose, and Joan really helped me with that. I felt, too, as she said, that Mound Molesters was a little loaded, but I, in a way, part of me wanted it to be loaded. But then I decided, no, it's going to, she said, it, she pointed out it'll be distracting, and I, I tend to agree with that. Um, so we went with Monsters, okay, for the title. And I wanted the exaggeration there, and I didn't know which one did a better job, and she helped me with that. So, um. So, and then the other major thing that really major that Joan helped me with is I've been taught as a poet always to say it in as few words as possible. No articles like the and an, and just skip over that, make it smooth. But as she pointed out, that's only for a certain type of poem where you are wanting to do that. And this poem wasn't that type that she pointed out. It was a conversational poem. And um, that was very helpful to me because I actually wrote the original in conversational style. And then I thought, no, no, this isn't going to fly. <laughs> you know? And so it was, I, I wrote it in, I, I, I can't, I went, I rewrote it in back into conversational style and I put the patio door and things like that in there instead of just patio door and it sounded better to me. So I agree with Joan. She's it. definitely right. In some poems, you do get rid of all of those little words, but this is the, you know, she even has conversation in it. So let's hear it. Okay. Mound Monsters. Through the patio door, my husband points out yet another ground squirrel, the 13 lined variety, as it burrows into our mound system. All the sand we hauled in, all those dollars we spent so that 13 lined ground squirrels can ruin our septic system. All those mound rules, no animals, no digging, no compacted soil allowed. Broken by burrowing squirrels. All those tiny striped heads peeking from our mound, triggering recurring arguments. Are there no other ways, I ask, as he reaches for his shotgun. No, he shouts and then slides the door open, presses its stock tight against his shoulder. The dog dance and aims. The dog dances. The gun booms. He and the dog race outside. He reaches into the burrow, grabs the body, halts his spinning, sniffing dog. They begin their carcass management ritual. He holds it near her nose, lets her smell it. Her eyes lock on it, follow its arc as he aims, tosses it into a burn barrel for final cremation. They return. He answers my initial question. Shooting them is fast and practical, he says. Then adds, you are not very practical. Anger erodes sleep, weakens immunity. I weigh the worth of its burn and respond, I am slow practical. There must be a gentler way. I let anger go. Relief fills me, warm as vanilla, smooth as honey. And that's and pretty it, See, there's this turn on the end. Um, after the violence of killing the rodent, um, relief fills me, warm as vanilla, smooth as honey. And if you look at the rough draft, can you get us back up to the draft? Yes. Um, it ends um, with almost prose at the end. Mm-hmm. I can do nothing with that particular 13 line ground squirrel except sympathize. After 50 years of marriage, my husband already knows I too can shoot. It is, it's a paragraph explaining the poem. Now look at that beautiful ending on the, yeah. yeah. I am yeah. so practical. There must be a gentler way. I let anger go. Relief fills me warm as vanilla, smooth as honey. Um, beautiful ending. Comments. Thanks. Um, one of the things now that I can see it um, on paper like this, um, one of the things I do with my poems is I sit back so I can't see any words and then I look at the shape. Um, and not all poems can be an oval, but the oval is the most pleasing shape. And right now we've got short at the ends and fat in the middle that you might want to play with the line divisions. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else have a comment? You can put it in the chat if you think of one later. Thanks, moving on. Macy. Okay. Um, so can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to just read the final poem and then talk about the changes? Um, yeah, I'm looking. Yeah. If you give us just a second here to look at where it starts and then I want to see where it ends. Oops. Oh, okay. It's too. Okay. Okay. All right, we can all see where it starts in the rough and even the difference in the title. Okay, here we go. Beneath the fading rose. For a week, I delighted in sweet scents of honey and spice. But now the fermented perfume of the drooping rose weights the air. Although it remains soft as a baby's skin, the curl of its tissue-thin petals is edged with a faint brown line. Now the lemon in my iced tea tastes like lightning-spiked rain, but its sour puckers my cheeks. A grandfather clock chimes the hour, loud and sure, then echoes like a wave on sand. She is late again, of course. She Skypes me from her garden where she is planting salvia for hummingbirds. Behind the bare stemmed tulips, I see lilacs exploding into purple plumes. I'm sorry the flowers were late, she says, but I'll visit soon and bring you daisies from my garden. She blows a kiss into the screen. Within my withered bouquet, in her frilly pink petticoat, a lone carnation nods. Like mothers and daughters, I think. Beneath the faded rose, a flower, full of intricate curves, still waiting to dance. Okay, so what do you think of the changes and which ones do you think worked for you? Okay, well, first of all, I had... had picked um to use as the prompts the um emotions senses tied to emotions and I had used the emotion of regret and when I went to write the poem I was sitting in front of this fading bouquet that I'd gotten from my daughter for for Mother's Day and I thought aha this is what Joan means when she says um don't try to write the poem let the poem right itself because here's this fading rose um based on you know seemed to fit with the things of regret I said so I was really gung-ho for my beginning um but Joan said um that that's really um what they call sc scaffolding mm -hmm. um and it's giving the structure to the poem by telling them what the poem is going to be about um and suggested that I start with the second stanza and then work um, in the meaning into the other part of the poem. Um, and so I worked on that, but I had to work a long time to figure out how to get it in later in the poem. Um, and, I, and I do have a question, Joan, um, for you is, um, is scaffolding always um, not a good thing? Well, that's a really interesting question because it's it's what I said at the beginning. You know, I give advice and then I go, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> does anyone know a poem where scaffolding works? Maybe I'll try to write one just to see if, if you know, it can work. Because when I look at this, she sent the bouquet with good intent, though it arrived a day late. That really feels like prose to me. It's telling me mm -hmm. for a week I delighted in sweet scents of honey and spice. Right there, my sense of smell. I mean, you're using language from the moment you're out of the gate. 
And uh, you mm -hmm. are beautiful, the card read. Again, you know, it's, but maybe anybody out there think of a poem where starting and what's coming to my mind is if if your scaffolding is a blunt statement and then you make your way around so we understand it and i'm trying to think of a statement that would be blunt that people would want to read um i never thought I would be so mean. And I have no idea where that would go. But that would be a blunt statement that, and then explore what took mm -hmm. the person to that meanness. Um, but um, it, starting with all of this language and then going right to the lemon and the iced tea that really has nothing to do with it except for the fact that you're waiting for her to call mm -hmm. um, and she's late again. And so that's coming in later in the poem. Um, and I, even I love where she is late again, of course, falls in this poem. I just think it's great. Mm -hmm. So an art, right, that's a, that's a blunt statement, but in that position, yeah. it works, it works really well. Anybody? So else? then the other thing, oh, yeah. I, would, I was just going to go on about some of the other things you suggested. Um, then there was um, rearranging of the stanzas to make them more um, musical, mm -hmm. rhythmical. Mm -hmm. um, that to me was a little... And, and some of the rearranging of the, I think the rearranging of the, um, of the uh, lines in that first, what's now the first stanza, that, that was pretty much Joan's suggestion to make it more rhythmical. And I'm not sure that I always, if that I would catch that um, difference on my own. Well, and even looking at the rhythm in that rough mm -hmm. draft rooted in her own flowers she finally calls rooted in her own root see that's a mouthful rooted in mm -hmm. her flowers she finally calls you know just little things mm -hmm. like that that when you're reading sing song you'll hear um um oh, no go ahead the earthy scent of turned soil exudes hope hope blanks from the earthy scent of soil and that's what i do when i'm i'm looking at these is rearrange and see what sounds rhythmic um and then the other thing i thought was was helpful um you did mention with line breaks of being a complete unit of thought and and that um that was helpful to me because i'm always kind of um confused about when to break lines I don't bring them in the middle of an of or the or anything but otherwise I kind of used them just to keep the line link lines of equal length as much as possible and you can see um, the level. you can see the improvement in line division in the the final draft because the line the tulips are just stems but the lilacs and your brain is going but what about the lilacs so the mm -hmm. tulips are just stem break but the lilacs are cascades of purple. That is a unit that goes together. And again, that rule is also made to be broken. Um, enjambment, where you stop a line so someone thinks you're going one direction and then you go a different direction um, mm -hmm. is an interesting tool. But it's done deliberately, not just because we're looking at the shapes of line. And again, if I lean back here so I can't read, I'm looking at a few lines here that I would split just to make the shape a little more pleasing um, to the yeah. eye. There is something to be said about how how the shape pulls us in. Um, advertisers know that. Um, and um, hopefully we'll get Lucy back. But you can see that Lucy's first draft is very long. And almost every poet I know, and if... You're not one of them. Raise your hand and then jump in and tell us I'm wrong. We turn the page to see how long a poem is. 
And if the poem is long, we kind of wander past it, unless there's something so wonderful in the opening line that we just can't stay away from it. But we we turn the page if it goes over a page and see her second draft doesn't. Um, now, I have some poems that are more than one page long, but when I'm laying out a book, I make sure the two sides are facing each other so someone has a sense of the length of it before they start reading it. Because will any of you turn the page and go, oh, no, I'm going to keep going on this one? <laughs> Sometimes maybe if you want to read the whole book, you go back and read that one later. But most of us are lazy readers. Thank you very much. Next. Mm -hmm. Hey, Nooper, are you awake? Yes, Joan. What time is it? It's 6 or 6 a.m. Oh, okay. Am I pronouncing your name right? Perfectly. Well, you have come the furthest distance, and hers isn't really a rough draft and a final draft. There are actually two poems um, with the same subject, but one of them is helping us who um, have English as our first language. So could you read them both? Yes, of course. I'll just uh, read the... Uh... Okay, I'll read the, uh, both versions. Tw Memory Dominoes. 21-year-old Prabha used to make the sweetest deserts in our building. When she married the neighbor, Ashish, I danced at the wedding. Six months later, the police came. They said she didn't know how to cook and spilled <clears throat> kerosene on her clothes. They caught fire, accidental burn case. I looked at my You Can Be Anything Barbie and threw it across the room. Then the uh, uh, other one is Prabha Didi used to make, oh, you want me to read the glossary? Didi means... Yeah, uh, I think that would help. Yeah, but the... Glossary after the Indian version would help, maybe. Um, okay, I'll read it anyways. Didi, sister, way of referring to an older girl in Hindi, a language we speak in India. Halwa is an Indian desert. Bhaiya, brother, way of referring to an older boy. Bharat is the procession of relatives and friends from the groom's side going to the wedding venue. And sari is an Indian garment worn by women. So, memory dominoes. Prabha Didi used to make the sweetest halwa in our building. I had danced in the Bharat. She married the neighbor, Ashish Bhaiya. Six months later, the police came. She didn't know how to cook. Spilled kerosene on her sari. It caught fire. Accidental burn case, they said. I looked at my You Can Be Anything Barbie, threw it across the room. Now, I suggested she write it both ways, and I have a preference, and I want to hear from you what you think. I like the second one. I agree. I do also. Well, certainly the opening in the second one is better than starting with 21-year-old. That's kind of clumsy on the tongue. I agree about the second one because it takes us somewhere that is unfamiliar to us. And I think it makes it much more real to us. Um, and I had no problem at all having to learn new words. And I like learning new words. What about other opinions? I thought it really worked well in juxtaposition with the You Can Be Anything Barbie, especially. That turn on the end. Yeah. That turn on the end, yes. Um, you know, even the fact, uh, one of my favorite lines is she used to make the sweetest halwa, is that how you say it, in our building. The idea that um, the authorities say she didn't know how to cook. Well, yes, she did. She made the sweetest dessert in the building. Um, other comments? 
It packs a lot of message in a very few lines. That's what I was going to say for being so short. You're kind of gut punched. Mm -hmm. And I think when you are gut punching, it's better to be short. Anything mm -hmm. else? I think June has a question, Joan. Yeah. Question? Go ahead, June. She's muted. Oh, okay. I don't know what's up with the mute tonight. It's just uh -huh. behaving really weird. Well, at the end, I'm hoping we have a few minutes that we can get some of these things in and maybe we can get people unmuted then. So let's move on. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. You made my day. <laughs> <laughs> and your day has just started. Okay. Am I next? Oh, yes, I am. Yes. Okay. I'll go ahead and, and read both of them. Broken. Not ever perfect, but comfortable together. That's how I thought we were until you explained that I was routinely inadequate. The cup in my chest, not full, but not empty, cracked and drained out and the hollow expanded, straining my chest, impaling my back, gagging my breath until the bitter liquid squeezed from my eyes. I don't really know if this broken trust can be repaired. I hate that your therapist knows my name. My heart shatters like a champagne flute when you pour in the bitter boiling news. The shards stab my chest and sever my windpipe so I cannot breathe. Then through tears, I gasp and ask why you waited so long to say what you needed for me to express how much I admire you and how much I treasure our history together. I thought we were soulmates, that you knew my heart without all the words. What do you think of the changes? These really feel like two different poems. Well, and, and they I like are. To, yeah. yeah. One of the things that we decided was um, to stick to just the moment of hurt mm -hmm. and not try to uh, talk to the other, per you know, to add mm -hmm. on the that last bit about talking to the other person, just mm -hmm. to make it one little nugget. Mm -hmm. I almost could see them as companion pieces though in a collection. So yeah. well, I I think I want to write that other poem, but it won't look exactly like this. <laughs> Having that conversation. When she came I kind of liked the, the with that. I kind of liked the that what is one say? of the best titles I have read in a long time. People are going to read a poem. I hate that your therapist knows my name. Broken, you know, okay. Been there, done that. But that title, one of the things I used to do with my students, we'd all show up with our poems and we'd quickly go around the room and read the titles. And almost always one or two titles, people would go, that one, that one, we want to hear that one. Um, and broken, okay. No. Um, not ever perfect, but comfortable together. That's scaffolding. That's telling us what you're going to do. And the second one, my heart shatters, tells us what has happened. What else? So we had a we had a discussion about whether to keep the word bitter mm. in the second version. Um, Joan suggested I I take it out because bitter doesn't break things. But then I came back with um, the news is bitter, and when it breaks, it's going to drench that bitterness 
in my innards. So I argued for keeping it in and I wanted to ask the group what you thought. You see, originally the bitter liquid squeezed from my eyes, so it was tears. Mm -hmm. mm. And I think the problem with bitter is it's two things. It's an emotion and it's also a taste. And so we have to decide how we're thinking about bitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you first think of taste before you think of an emotion, right? Mm-hmm. I like that. That makes the people think about what they're reading. I like poems that make you think. And that that adds that element of duplicity, which is sometimes a good thing because um, it's it is both. And in the in the first draft, um, until you explained that I was routinely inadequate and I was able to pull out of her what does it mean to be routinely inadequate? And she definitely expressed it. You needed for me to express how much I admire you. Oh, that was the way of inadequacy. So that was a, oh, that was an aha. Um, and that's why that title works so well. The mm -hmm. fact that the therapist knew more about her than he was willing to tell her um, is really meaningful. Thanks. Next. Thank you, everybody. Katrina, are you here? I am. Um, thank you. This poem was written on the Ice Age Trail Alta Junction segment. And I'll read the draft first. How to love a rainy day. You walk the rain-drenched hillside glowing bright with trillium sails that float above old leaves. Beneath your feet now wet and wrinkled white, above leaf-cut gray sky that shakes the trees. You listen to the warbler's call for love, their waterfall trilling over hillside peaks and look for yellow feathers up above. Receive the kiss of raindrops on your cheek. You bend to smell the taste of mushroomed earth, moon cratered morels, meaty brown and sweet, and breathe the new of green and thicket birth. Feel forest waking up to grow and eat. Mosquitoes humming drink you in like wine, sweet truth of you and nature intertwined. And here is the revised draft. How to love a rainy day. You walk a rain-drenched hillside that is bright with trillium sails that float above old leaves. Look up through clouds and leaves to find the light. Receive the kiss of rain diffused through trees. You listen to the warblers call for love, their trilling falling over moraine peaks. Then let your feet slide along trailing mud and savor time without the need to speak. You bend to smell the taste of mushroomed earth, moon cratered, morels, meaty, brown, and sweet, and breathe the forest air that's freshly birthed. Feel life that's waking up to grow and eat. Mosquitoes drink you in like sweet red wine, sharp truth of you and nature intertwined. And see, this poem didn't need much, but what did you do to it? Joan had some great suggestions for things that just didn't quite make sense in the first draft. Um, so images that didn't fit together or looking for feathers, kind of not really connecting directly to the birds. So I did some rewording that worked really well. Um, I can see just... it with, um, and breathe the new of green in thicket birth, which is not nearly as meaningful as, and breathe the forest air that's freshly birthed. That's, oh, okay, I get it. Ooh. And you walk the rain-drenched hillside glowing bright. The subject is you. And it's the hillside that's glowing bright. So in her final draft, 
You walk a rain-drenched hillside that is bright with trillium. And that is a nice move in a rhythm and, rhythm and rhyme poem to not end at the end of the line that is bright with trillium sails. So it rolls into the next line. Other ones. I really like the looking for yellow feathers up above. Um, I like both poems a great deal, though, and um, I just, that's what I do when I hear a warbler. <laughs> I look for yellow feathers up above, and it's very okay. descriptive of what actually happens, um, and the fact that they're yellow and a different color and from the trees and all that. But I also like what she did to it, too, in the second poem. So I guess for me, I look for feathers down below. I look for birds above. Um, and I know what you're... you're but, but yeah, you're, I look for the feathers you're using the, the feathers birds. Yeah, the but I, I see yeah. what you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love the switch um, instead of... Um, uh, sweet truth to sharp truth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we, we talked about, the idea of, um, all right, this is good, what's better? Um, drink you in like wine, like sweet red wine is more specific. Nice title, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Trudy. Is Trudy here? Are we trying to unmute her? I saw her. Well, hang on a minute. Maybe she isn't here. She's there. Okay. I see Jan. Okay. There she is. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. There we go. We got you. Yes. <clears throat> um, I tried a new form, which is called Rundine. And to do this, and also pick the 15 words to try to use that. So I didn't have a title the first time. And the original went, listening to music of Mozart, into my heart leapt thoughts of Claire, the reality of the care, the love that burns within her heart. Indiana Church, a work of art, the groom looking so debonair, God is so good. Happy faces, wedding vows start. I'm touched and so happy to be there. Joy rippling for the loving pair, loving them upward goes a prayer. God is so good. So that was the first one. My first granddaughter was Claire, who just got married. <laughs> so that's where this came from. And the final poem was an Indiana wedding. Coming together heart to heart, down the aisle comes beautiful Claire to join John who is waiting there, no longer to be apart. Indiana church, a work of art, the groom looking so debonair, God is so good. Holding hands, the wedding vows start. Hearing them, upward goes a prayer for God's blessing on the happy pair. Oh, yes, Lord, till death do us part. God is so good. <laughs> do you have something to say about the changes? This is an example that we were looking for before, where sometimes a blunt, straightforward line really works. God is so good has a beautiful rhythm. It fits the message of a wedding, but it also fits the response of the grandma. You know, that it's not just that this is a wedding, but God is so good. And it's the repeated line. Plus this was a form I had never seen before. So it taught me something too. Um, so what did you change and why? Well, you said once the basic poem was there. I didn't have to stick to just the 15 words um, was one thing. And also to try more to put people into the moment um, mm -hmm. more than that. The first one. 
that if you look at that first one, into my heart leapt thoughts of Claire. Thinking about her is not nearly as meaningful as down the aisle comes beautiful Claire. Mm -hmm. The reality of the care. And see, because there's multiple meanings on care, um, taking care of someone, you know, needing care, that line did not work nearly as well as the fact that she's coming down the aisle to join John, who is waiting there. And that's part of the rhyme pattern of this particular kind of poem. And we all know, well, Indiana worked for her, even though it was in the word list. Um, but right. yeah, to say that now that it's your poem, all of those words that, you know, came from the list, you don't have to keep anymore. Right. And did you get rid of burns? See, burns was the word that didn't work for me. Um, yes. Definitely worked beautifully, but yeah, burns. Comments. <laughs> And see, a, a rough draft oftentimes will be untitled, um, but I would suggest you never leave a poem untitled unless the message of it is that you're refusing to title, that I will not put a name on anything, um, because otherwise it just is there with every other poem, and a title will pull in a reader. Well, mm -hmm. certain types of poems, though, like haikus, yes, don't haikus need to don't have, have titles. But it doesn't say untitled yeah. at the top. It just right. yeah, starts. Rudy, I'm curious to know if you're going to give a copy of that to Claire and John as a wedding present, or did well, you? Um, yes, I did, did send them a copy. Very good. good. Okay. Uh, now that you're saying that, an Indiana wedding. I wonder if it's the Indiana wedding. Uh, the difference between Anne and the, you know, one very specific mm -hmm. and one. Um, well, I had. Although the rhythm is very nice yeah. of Anne, Indiana. I also had my youngest daughter get married in Indiana last fall. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Indiana is a family thing. Well, two daughters. Uh, Two daughters live there, yes. Well, thank you. Next. Deborah. Did anybody see her? I'm not sure I did. Well, if she pops in, we can come back to it. Jan? Uh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you. All right, my original poem, Finding Heaven. The lilacs reached up and out on Lake Street, drew me to stop my car. Their pinks and purple surrounded me as if I were in a cathedral and their smell otherworldly. I thought, this is heaven, the search is over. The final poem, Entering Heaven. The lilac bushes reach out along Lake Street, beckon me to leave my car and linger. Pink, purple, and lilac flowerets shelter me as if I am a cathedral in a cathedral and their fragrance, otherworldly. <laughs> you want to talk about the changes? Well, one thing I asked uh, Joan was, is there such a thing as too short a poem? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, and uh, if I may quote you, you said, people have turned the page when the poem is too long, but they rarely turn the page on too short a poem. So I... I, I like that. Um, the second poem is in present tense rather than past tense. And I bought that. I, the, the first poem, I told you that heaven, that there was heaven, it, it, the search was over, I told you. And in, in, the, in, the, in the first one, and the second one, I, my title has to do more work. And have you 
understand as I felt, maybe this is as close to heaven as I'm going to get with this sight and, and the smell. So I think that's most of what we talked about. I really like that switch with the title. That's really so much more punchy. It also gives us the the chance to have the aha, otherworldly. Oh, it's heaven, entering heaven, rather than being told at the end. I thought this is heaven. The search is over. Um, and also that that short poem thing. It is hard to write a good short poem. Um, Hummingbird, uh, which I don't think they're publishing anymore. Are they done now? I think would only take short poems, and I think I probably only got in three times um, because I have not perfected the art of the short poem. Um, but um, it's it's a skill. I also like what happened with the shape where it goes four, three, two now. Hmm. I really like the first stanza where she has Lilac, Lake Street, and Linger all together in one oh, stanza. Uh -huh, it really uh -huh. makes it musical. And, and leave. Lilac, Lake, leave, Linger. Yeah, yeah, leave too. <laughs> right. I, I like all of it, but that just really struck me. It leads you in so musically and it never and then it never falls down after that, you know. So and one of the other things we talked about, because when it is really short, you can look at every single word and say, is this the right word? Is does it surround you? And then I'm thinking, okay, then you probably kind of got yourself tangled up in the bushes here, but sheltering like a cathedral, that really works. I believe there's a change of tense here. We go from kind of a past tense feeling to a right now feeling, and I think that draws the reader in. Present tense is more immediate, and you can't always use it, but um, oftentimes when I've got a past tense poem, um, I'll read it in present tense and see if it works. Um, occasionally, um, I've actually made it work by going into future tense. What if? If this happened, then this would have happened. Um, sometimes it works, and sometimes it gets awkward and wordy. Mm -hmm. Next. This was a long one, so do we want to- Let's just... look at the, the draft a little bit first then. Okay. Okay. You'll be able to see, if you're looking at this now, this one is more prosy than, than her final. You can see all the creatures were in attendance. One of the things you'll see is a change from um, passive verbs to active. All right, let's hear it. Uh, another world. Grace by chance and happenstance, a carpet of emerald green, shimmering in the morning light, surrounds me. Dainty flowers with delicate buds, silver stars, snowdrops, and rose heart flowers adorn the copse. A fairy maiden tiptoes down the petal-strewn path in a trillium gossamer gown, her tiny face raised to the light. Forget-me-nots, unfurling ferns and soft mosses form her bouquet. Tiny woodland sprites are dressed in finery, pink tulip flounces, cream daffodil blouses, bluebell trousers and acorn caps. Springtime casts its spell. So how is it different from your draft? Well, it's it's shorter, it's much more compact. It's um, 
it's present tense. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, I, I think I had mixed tenses in the uh, previous one, which sometimes I, I do. Um, this is less wordy. Mm -hmm. there, there's part of me that worries a little bit that that feeling of magic is a little bit gone for me. Just Let's look back at the, the rough draft and see if there are some lines that the other participants think you should put back for the magic. I don't know. Does anybody else think the magic is gone? <laughs> I didn't feel it was gone. It's very, very visual. Um, especially the, the, that the magic was concentrated and, and, um, and to me, it was more interesting. It, I guess I was drawn more into it because it was shorter too. Sure. And see, if you're looking at magic, the small woodland was vibrating with growth and magic. Um, you could make that active. The small woodland vibrates with growth and magic, but I think you showed that. The fairy well, you made. pointed you did a, you did a wonderful job, Joan, of helping me see how I was repeating myself through you know, being too wordy, you know, and where but that it, is what should happen in a rough draft because you should just let it flow out. That's that's what a rough draft looks like. Yeah, and I just really saw it's like, wow, I really am. I'm, you know, like you said, think it's already vibrating. Or you said I said something about. And even I spied another world. It's very clear to us that you have spied another right. world. Right. Yeah, the description of what they were wearing really, really brings them to life. And then I think one of the things we talked about was getting rid of the bunnies and stuff. Um, you know, that the, you bunnies have all, the bunnies one way. The bunnies one way. The magic. <laughs> I love the sound of forget me nots unfurling ferns. Um, and then you've got form in the next line, um, you know, for alliteration. And then in the next to last stanza, the flounces, blouses, trousers, mm -hmm. that, that sounds yeah, really lovely blouses, with the owl sound, too. Yeah. I like the last line, too, springtime cast its spell, so that you don't really need to be that's the magic is there. Um, yeah, and you help me with that last that just that, you know, again, being more, cons you know, tightening it up and understanding tense. And now looking and at the shape, it seems that almost falls into three line stanzas and you might be able to uh, um, make that happen even more visually, a fairy maiden tiptoes next line down the petal strewn path. No, yeah, that would have to move into, oh, well, it could move into the next line if that's split. A fairy maiden tiptoes next line down the petal strewn path in a trillium gossamer, gossamer gown. Then the next stanza, her tiny face raised to the light, forget me. And then uh, it would almost fall. That would be, that would work. Face. That would work. But out. And then it, that line wouldn't be hanging out so much visually. Yes. Yeah, I that, see. That. You know, you know, if you lean back and don't look at words, you know, you're going okay. You know that some some shapes are more visual than others. I think if you uh, shorten the sentences up like that, it also makes it easier to read, right? I think for most people it does. Uh, the, just the same as having to turn the page when the page is black and, you know, long lines, it, it does make it harder that you have to have a real dedicated reader. Um, also, when you think of the, the size of a literary journal, um, I don't think editors consciously say, well, this isn't going to look good on the page, um, <laughs> but like, well, on, in Moss Peglet, which is laid out by by one of our friends, John Bloner, I just love to see what he does with the poems and the images and stuff, because some shapes fit a page much, mm -hmm. much more nicely than others. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that, um, in the original poem I really liked was that she mentioned the fairy's wings were tucked in and I think she could still put that in after gown because it would also it would make the lines longer but it would balance out the length of that first line. Well the tucked in I I had trouble visualizing that because you're looking at an old English teacher here and tucked in I want to know in where. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I, I'm thinking of, a, of it like a bug or a bird with primary and secondary wings, but I'm a biologist, so they're just okay. tucked into each other. Okay. <laughs> they're even tucked into each other, their nets spread out. So I don't know. It's just it's just the thought I had. I really loved that image, I guess, because it shows her slight tucked? restraint. You know, it shows that a she's tucked very wings? a tucked wing or something like that. Yeah. Would there be value it shows in her restraint that she's very maiden and delicate and you know <laughs> I don't know. I, well, I do have I do have to say this. I tried to save her wings because I put it back and then I couldn't quite I haven't let her wings go yet. So well, let's uh, get okay. her wings back. <laughs> um, the the wing I, I liked her wings. Where's the wing line? It's under <laughs> a gown of gossamer, right about there. Right. It's just describing her a little bit more. And it's just okay. that most people won't even bother to mention that, you know, but it does. All right. Something. Hang on. She's got a gown of gossamer. Is there something more interesting than tucked in her wings? Hmm. What? Folded. I don't know if that's more. Oh, folded makes way to sense to me. It. That makes sense to me. And it also suggests that she's trying to blend in with, the, you know, this real mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's another world, but but she's folded, wings folded works. Yeah. I, what does I that look on the, the second one? Wings folded. It also looks, makes me think of her looking very elegant and composed. Yeah. You know, almost like your hands yeah. are folded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, I like it that. forwards that image of slight restraint that mm -hmm. I think we want wings to... uh, in a trill in a trillion yeah. gossiper gown, wings folded, her tiny face raised to the light. That's lovely, and right. that raised to the light, folded. It's almost prayerful. Right. Good right. job, you guys. You just put. That Yay! We saved her. We Yay, saved her wings. We saved her wings. <laughs> Thank you. Next. Oh, we had fun with this one. It was a little too wide to go side by side. Yeah. Yeah. So I should probably read the second, the final version. Or the, well, then we'll look back at the first one. The, cur the current version. Okay. Ambivalent, perplexed. Oh, you know what? I'm going to sit. I'm just going to say this now. I don't that that shouldn't have had an and there. I'm gonna say oh, no, we're gonna change okay. it right there for the title. Ambivalent, perplexed, intrigued. Ooh, look at that. Ambivalent looks like murky water with strands of algae rising. Perplexed <laughs> appears as locust thorns and rocks in the creek. Intrigued is fledged bluebirds flying in morning mist. Ambivalent is quietly raucous and can't be ignored. Perplexed roils, bubbles, gurgles, and plops. Intrigued is a chorus of frogs and the crackle of burning brush. Ambivalent smells like compost early in decomposition. Perplexed is the mingled scent of cinnamon and ginger. Intrigued holds the aroma of cilantro and the forest floor. Ambivalent tastes like blackstrap molasses. Perplexed is sauerkraut with homemade ketchup. Intrigued yeah. savors rhubarb on vanilla custard. There's another line. No? There's another stanza. Oh, sorry. Oh. Did I miss it? Oh, there, there it is. Ambivalent can be rough if rubbed the wrong way. Perplexed is a carpet burn or unexpected rain. Intrigued feels like wind brushing my skin, like new wind brushing my skin. All right, you want to say something about what you did? Well, um, I did the exercises that you did with, that you suggested, and I pushed mm -hmm. myself to do them multiple times, and I'm resistant to, was resistant to it and and but I enjoyed the press I enjoyed pushing myself to do that and each time I wrote all kinds of feelings down and then I pulled out um 
as I did them, I pulled out the feeling that came across to me that that leapt out to me of the list. And the first time I did it, it was ambivalent. The second time it was perplexed. And the third time it was intrigued. And it became evident to me, and then I used the senses, but it became evident to me that there was a progression or there were that, that ambivalent, perplexed and intrigued um, have a relationship as well. Hmm. Right from the start, there were all kinds of wonderful detailed images. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the images are just from my life. That one of the suggestions that did not work for her um, was my ear wanted the adjectives to become nouns. Now, that would have been easy with ambivalent, becoming ambivalence. But perplexed, it wouldn't have been as easy. Intrigue, it would have worked. It would have been difficult with perplexed to make make them nouns. Yeah, and we were curious about what people felt about that because I... I wanted to keep it ambivalent, perplexed, mm -hmm. and intrigued because what I was really saying is when I am ambivalent or when when one is ambivalent, as opposed to... And we even discussed the possibility of that, of putting when I am ambivalent or being ambivalent mm -hmm. looks. What do you think, the rest of you? I really like it the way it is. I didn't have any problem making the knowing what she was meaning by that. I like it visually having those words line up down the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I also put a note that um, it's really fun to see an exercise morphed into something that is the person's rather than still the same old exercise. And mm -hmm. that's what happened here. And I've got a note that um, I can't see in the draft, so maybe um, it changed very quickly. Um, that I said, you know, don't completely strip the conversational quality, which we have been taught to do, you know, taking taking out all those little extra words, but it's very conversational. I think that was one of the um, main changes when traditional poet poetry went to modern poetry. Um, that it, um, well, that sound and sense idea that the sound of it, if you needed those little words, you put them back in, um, mm -hmm. flying in the rain has a nice sound. I like this poem, but I think, I feel like there's still more that she can do with it. Um, these are three really hard things to pull out and give us descriptions of and compare to each other. So it's worth the time. Um, what I mean by that is like her second to last stanza. I think um, there is one more down there too. Yeah. Ambivalent tastes like blackstrap molasses. Tastes is a direct term as well as perplexed is sauerkraut with homemade ketchup. But intrigued savors. I like that. And I, I think you could take that idea and go a little farther with... Um, mm -hmm explaining the taste without saying taste you know oh, if you've got a okay. savor how else do you how else do you taste it mm -hmm. so uh, and i think you could take that idea i think a little farther in some of these other ones so, so even things um like intrigued intrigued is new wind brushing my skin mm -hmm. um Intrigued, savory, oh, that works, perplex, is, yeah. Um, ambivalent is blackstrap molasses, and we would know it's a taste because what else are, we, what else are you going to do with it? Um, well, and initially it was um, blackstrap molasses and yogurt. Oh. Mm, but we we okay. were kind of pulling it back for this length of the Okay, I, yeah, I've been tightening. I have a note here. Yeah, a compromise between meaning and sound. Um, yeah, and I was curious about, and I, I, you know, I was just curious with playing with the sound. Um, 
And I love the, the aroma of cilantro and the forest floor because they're both distinctive, but they're different smells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thanks. Next. All right. I think mine are short enough probably yes, to read them enough. both. Yeah. And um, so I use the 15 word technique and the original poem there is very much a first draft. Um, what we don't reveal. Once vibrant as crayons, we celeried the virtue of committee to haunt instead amid exposed bricks or rakish secrets. We'd become obsolete with our blue-eyed and mysterious ways, choosing to calendar in broadcloth the thundering of our loins, our own sparks flew to Oslo, but no palpable cure presented. And you you told me that you liked the title and the shape and the rhyme or rhythm, but you had a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say that that is true, that it was just way too <laughs> all over the place. Um, so my second, my final poem is, is missing a couple of lines at the bottom, but I'll read those too. Okay. What we don't reveal. Once vibrant as crayons, lives wide like broadcloth, replete with blue-eyed and mysterious ways. Now rakish paths eschewed for a calendar of silent dates. Only an echo from the past haunts, but a lingering still. What line did we say there were a couple lines missing? Yeah, or they didn't. So it's but a lingering still. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, is sure. the ending. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, one of the things that I said to Maureen, I love the title and the fact that I don't understand some lines really fits with that title. The fact that right from the, the go, she's saying, there's something here that I'm not saying, mm -hmm. um, but there was some, I'm still going, hmm, mm. <laughs> but that's probably good, you know, in some ways. But uh, one of the things I used to tell my students when an uh, uh, infant is just reaching that point where they're going to stand up um, and they're shake, they're about to fall over. All you have to do is hold out one little finger. And mm -hmm. if they balance on your tiniest finger, they're on their feet. And so I need the one little finger here mm -hmm. that makes me go, now I get it. Mm -hmm. What is only an echo from the past that haunts, but a lingering still? And what does it have to do with what's happening now? Mm -hmm. Am I the only one? No. Mm -mm. No, I, I was think what I was felt that too. I think what I was trying to get at is the, the kind of exploring the losses that are experienced with aging and and sometimes a loss is something that maybe we were glad to get rid of, but it's still a loss, you know. And what and, is now rakish paths issued for a calendar? of silent dates for a calendar. Mm -hmm. Is it like you're saving yourself and you don't take as many risks anymore because you know you're older and more vulnerable to certain risks? Is it like that or is it something different from that? Or are you saying that the rakish paths are now gone and instead you have a calendar Yep. Okay, yeah, there's the silent dates, mm -hmm. a calendar of, I, I'm starting to get it. Okay, so in other words, the spontaneity, the rakish paths for a calendar of, what's on that calendar? Yeah. Plan empty dates? Empty. I'm wondering if it's em empty dates. Or well, even, mm -hmm. I mean, your calendar is full of, Foot doctor, dentist. Um, <laughs> That's what I was that, thinking. All this maintenance yeah. stuff, you know, that comes mm -hmm. as you get older. <laughs> yeah. Every year I used to get, they don't make it anymore, but it was the the calendar of 
I can't remember if they called it the earth or whatever, but it would tell you what was happening to the earth that day. The salamanders are coming to the surface. And I think, oh, yeah, that's much more interesting than I have to go to the dentist. All right, that is starting to make sense to me. So it is for a calendar replaced by a calendar of such and such a dates. Mm -hmm. Then only an echo from the past haunts. Okay, that. Now it's starting to make sense. I like all the lines, but I think you need to give us one card that's up. Like all the cards mm -hmm. seem to be down to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to give us one card that's up. That yep, we... like that little finger. To yep, like your little finger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the middle finger. <laughs> <laughs> this is fascinating, but we need to move on. Yeah, sorry. And I think we are, yeah, we are to the last one, unless some of our lost people can be found. All right, June, who we couldn't hear before. She's there. She she was here, but we couldn't hear her when she wanted to ask a question. Mm. Oh, yeah, the, it's... Yeah, she just posted in the chat, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. okay. So she's there. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody else should read her poem. I'm um, June Paul. She says, it, yeah, she says I'm, I'm here. here. I can, cannot, cannot unmute. unmute. Um, can you unmute her? I can't. I don't know what is up with the mute tonight. It's like Would someone like to read it? I've been finding if you use the mute in the lower corner, it works better than the one in the picture. If that's any help, I don't know. It's only you hear that the lower it's only left. The one in the, the lower choice. corner. The it's one in the lower left. It, yeah, it's only giving me the choice to ask to unmute. I can't okay. see to unmute her. That's... Would someone like to read her poem? You can see right from the beginning, um, in the garden of life, the one I am imagining, I told her to be brave and just take us there. You know, you don't have to tell us it's imagination. Um, I'll, I'll read if you want. Okay, go for it. Sure. Sorry, June. I, I'll pretend I'm June. Contemplation in the garden of life. In the garden of life, I could be a grain of sand, clump of clay or dirt. I could be a drop of water, a bird bath or fountain. In the garden of life, there are so many things I could be, a seed or a maple tree with whirligigs bearing seeds. I could be a bulb, an azalea shrub, a creeping ground cover, a peony bush with fragrant flowers. I could be anything among many things in the garden of life, a caterpillar, cocoon, a spider or worm that spins strong silken threads. I could be a monarch butterfly, luna moth, any kind of ant. I could be a ladybug, a beetle, or delicate lake emerald dragonfly. I could find delight in being a songbird sitting on the fence. But the most beautiful thing in this garden of life is that I've learned to be simply content with being me. And see, I already mentioned that she um, got rid of the, I can imagine, I can imagine, and we go there, you know, we go there with her and then notice the difference in the ending. Um, Mm. All these things I can only imagine walking through the garden of life or relaxing like I am here on the bench. That's what's really happening. But the images work for themselves. The most mm. beautiful thing in this garden of life is that I've learned to be simply content. It doesn't matter if she's on a bench imagining this garden of life has been brought to life. Comments in the last minute here. I like the second one better than the first. I like how she groups some things together, like the water, um, mm -hmm. the fountain, mm -hmm. the drops. You, you're kind of gathering. I could be this kind of water, this kind of water, this mm -hmm. kind of water. So I kind of like those those things, um, which she kind of loses a little bit at the end. But the the focus of this whole point brings us to their, her final line, which I love is that little twist that brings it right down mm -hmm. to home. 
And I think that um, being content with being self now is is highly remarkable. And, uh, and uh, the fact that she sees all of these things and yet she's content with being herself and sharing whatever she is with all of this other stuff that she could have been or could be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a remarkable poem. And I think there are, there are places up to send this poem oh, because uh, so many of us are searching for self. The only thing um, I like what is happening at that ending very much, but the flow is so beautiful in the lines above it. I could find delight in being a songbird sitting on the fence, but the most beautiful thing in the gut, there's an abruptness in the sentence structure there, and I'm trying to pull those two lines together. I could find delight in being a songbird sitting on the fence. Um, How about I have found I have learned oh. to be simply content with being me, or I or have being found myself. I have found. Change it to the I have found from I could find, and you have to fight with that horrible grammar thing. Um, that there are some times when incorrect grammar is correct in conversation. For example, uh, when they say, who's there? And you say, it's me. I mean, if you said, it is I, people would think you were a total <laughs> snob. And technically, when you have, I have learned, it should be myself. But in our everyday language, we're so used to saying me that you have to decide which works better to be the language of every day or the language of, you know, formal English. Um, but you could pull those, she could pull, the, pull those lines together. Um, I could find delight in being a songbird sitting on the bench, but I have learned to be content with being me. Um, pulling those together so you don't get the choppiness of, but the most beautiful thing. So we are out of time. Sorry, we don't have any time for more questions. But um, when we missed a couple of people, I knew we had a little more time to talk about things. And it was great hearing from so many of you. That was great. Thank you, Joe. Well, thank you all of you. It's been really enjoyable. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm new. Does this happen every year? Thank well, this you. was the second year Tori said, oh, I wish you could do this every year. And I said, okay. well, we might run out of emerging people. <laughs> but, um, so this was the second year and it was. OK, well, you'll see me next fun. year if you do it. <laughs> well, it would be lots. Yeah. Uh, well, Thank I was you. just thinking today that reading them all is such a challenge. But I thought maybe there'd be some other poet that would take half. Um <laughs> which which could be fun but it's it's been fun i'm looking forward to writing my own stuff tomorrow but it's been fun. <laughs> so good night all thank, thank you, you, you so much. Thank, you, thank, thank you everybody for thank it you, was fun. thank you yeah. i'll good let night. you know i'll let you thank know you, when Joan. the video is thank posted. you tori okay thank you Sorry for you people that we could not get off mute. Yeah, somebody must have changed the uh, settings for mute. I don't know what it was going on. Night. Good night. Night. Oh, it won't let me leave. Good night.